and welcome to clinicalpath.com. Today's topic is diseases of the glomerulus. Diseases of the glomerulus really have to be divided into two fundamentally different groups. We're talking about the primary diseases of the glomerulus, and then the secondary diseases of the glomerulus fall within their own disease spectrum. Glomerular diseases are pretty important. When we talk about the causes of end-stage kidney disease in the United States, meaning people that are on dialysis, by far and away the number one cause is going to be diabetes mellitus. And the second commonest cause is going to be hypertension, which is not a disease of the glomerulus, but a disease of the vasculature. When you take a look at these two, you're really talking about somewhere around two-thirds, 70% of all the patients that are on dialysis. When you come down and talk about the primary glomerulopathies, you're really down around the 1% to 2% level. So while they are the number three, we can see that overwhelmingly kidney disease is diabetes mellitus in the glomerulus and hypertension in the vasculature. So let's start by talking about the primary glomerulopathies. Most of the primary glomerulopathies are going to be immune mediated. And that's important to compare that to tubular diseases because when we talk about our tubulo interstitial diseases, these are going to be overwhelmingly due to ischemia, due to toxicity, especially when you're talking about idiopathic damage from uh, drug use, and then last but not least, infection, meaning pyelonephritis. So glomerular diseases are fundamentally different in their pathophysiology than tubular interstitial diseases. And there are three basic mechanisms of immune injury. The first to think about is going to be immune complex. This is by far and away the most common. And when we talk about immune complex, we want to differentiate between IgG and IgA. So let's start with the immune complexes from IgG. Due to the physical intrinsic nature of the IgG immune complex, they can end up in one of two places in our glomerulus. So you should be familiar with our image here. This is the filtration unit of the glomerulus. So here we have the endothelial cell, which are fenestrated. Here we have the basement membrane, which is negatively charged to keep out negatively charged albumin. And here we have the foot processes with the slit membranes, which keep out proteins based on size and shape, so predominantly globulins. So the two places we're going to see our IgG immune complexes are going to be here, starting with our subendothelial. So let's start with that. When you have subendothelial, you're going to see activation then of C3A and C5A. But because they're on the subendothelial side, you can see that they are in contact with the overlying plasma. So that then is going to attract inflammatory cells like polymorphonuclear cells, neutrophils, and macrophages. And that sets up an acute inflammatory reaction that is so severe, it literally punches holes through that filtration unit big enough that we can see red cells come through. Red cells coming through that are damaged. They're dysmorphic when you look at them. But nonetheless, red cells, they are. So when we talk about our subendothelial, we're talking about inflammatory damage, which means we're going to see patients that are going to have red cells in the urine, and that's going to be our nephritic syndrome. Compare and contrast that with subepithelial. When the immune complexes are subepithelial here between the basement membrane and those foot processes, you can see that they can still activate complement because complement filters through the basement membrane being a globulin, but you notice it is not in contact with the